Good evening and welcome to Revelation of Hope. I am your host, Amado Luzbet, and I'm delighted that we can start this journey through the book of Revelation, prophecies as well from the book of Daniel. I welcome you. Many of you have registered online, and if you have not, we have an incredible team that is in the foyer, and they have cards for you. Maybe right now you're filling out one of those cards, and you could just hold it up, and we'll have one of our team members come out and get that from you. It is so important to be able to have these cards filled out because we also would like to enter you uh, into a drawing. Every one of our presentations will have beautiful gifts that you will receive and we'll draw from, from those and you may be a winner. And so we also want to avail ourselves. Living in Florida, we never know what the weather has in store. So should things change and we might have to notify you, that registration card provides us the avenue to do so. So thank you so much for coming out. I wonder if you received a card that's an invitation to Revelation of Hope. It might have been the one that initially was given to you. We have some of those cards in the foyer. We want you, if you have one with you, we'd like for you to invite someone maybe a friend, a family member, just let them know. We still definitely have a lot of uh, opportunities to invite them to join us. Well, it is wonderful that the rain came and we hope has will stay away and that we are out this evening for the opening of tonight's presentation. I'd like to introduce to you our speaker. She'll be up here very soon to share. And our speaker is... Trinity Evans. She is a young woman with a lot of enthusiasm, passionate for the Lord Jesus Christ, a young follower, and she exudes this in energy and dedication. She's right here in Florida, or a native of Florida, in Tampa, in fact. She loves music and education, and she just wants to share the love of God with everyone. There are several things that you will be learning and will be uh, discovering through this journey through the book of Revelation. I want to share a few things that we will also be uh, providing. We have, and you should have received, a, a Bible study guide. And it's a simple lesson, but it goes in depth, accompanying tonight's topic. This evening, the focus is having to do with the end. And the question is, is it here, near or mere fear? And Trinity is going to be unpacking that. At the close of this evening's presentation in the foyer, um, as you're heading out, please take a summary of her presentation this evening. We want you to have that. The other thing is that in-depth study that we're also providing you, that you might, should have with you, if you would complete every single one of those studies and you just turn it in, let's say you take it tonight and you get into it and you bring it back, we have some folks that will go over and look it over and correct it and all that, and we'll give you the next one every evening you can receive this beautiful study Bible. It is called the Andrews Study Bible. And in fact, um, I have a beautiful copy of it, and I think I should unpack it. It, is, it smells brand new. And i got to tell you, in every single section, there is a wealth of information, notes to go over and examine. We would love you to have a copy of this in your own hands. And so go ahead, <clears throat> go through those studies, turn them in, and then we'll continue with the rest of the studies. And we'd like to, at the end of the series, give you your own study Bible. How do you like that? Does that sound good? All right, excellent. Well, I want to take a moment. And just, um, again, tell you that we are delighted that you have come out to be a part of this journey with Revelation of Hope. 
I'm going to have a prayer, and then we're going to have some music, and very soon our own Trinity Evans will be delivering the message of this evening. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we come in the name of your Son, Jesus, as we're about to embark in understanding Revelation as well as the book of Daniel. Help us to glean from it information that helps us in today and in preparation for what you reveal. Be with our speaker and every single one of us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone.
Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Tim. Folks, before Trinity gets up here, I've been approached by folks in registration, and they're just asking, is there someone here who has not received one of the study guides? Anybody here who has not received a study guide? Also, the other question is, have you all filled out the registrations? Thank you so much. Just let us know if that's the case. And now with us, let's welcome and give a heartwarming welcome to Trinity Evans, our speaker. be down here tonight if that's all right with you guys. Um, to be very honest, I kind of want to do this in a way that I know I would listen to if I was in the audience. So we're going to do things a little different. So as you guys have probably heard, we're going through the book of Revelation and Daniel. This is called the series called Revelation of Hope. And so I'm very excited and very interesting because there's a lot of things to be understood and seen in Revelation. I want to tell you guys a story real quick. When I was growing up, my dad was a traveling motivational speaker. And so I was on airplanes all the time. And if you guys have been on an airplane before, you know that they, they do their cute little like bit with like, make sure you're buckled in and this is like where your emergency kit is. And I remember growing up, I could not care less. I, my little five-year-old self was just happy to be sitting in a seat where I could look out the window and I could see the clouds. I was imagining what the clouds taste like. I did not care at all of this information that they were giving to me. And I remember when I was older, I learned what a plane crash was. And all of a sudden, the information that the flight attendants were telling me became a lot more valuable, became a lot more serious. I actually cared about what they were saying because I recognized there was something at stake which goes along with our presentation today called The End Here, Near, or Mere Fear. What's the point of all of this? Is, is any of this prophetic stuff even real? What does the Bible have to say about it? And if, what was the Bible even talking about the times that we're living in now? What have the Bible meant 20 years from now? It's got nothing to do with this. Let's find out together. Once again, I said we're going to be in Revelation. So if you guys have your Bibles or your phones, don't get tempted if you pull out your phones. I will stare you down. But I want you to fact check me at every turn. That we're doing this together. I want you guys to see it for yourselves. I'll have stuff on here, but feel free to look for yourselves. All right. Let's get started. All right. Revelation 1.1, it says, and this is the first verse of the first chapter of Revelation. You guys know what an introduction is? So this is the introduction to Revelation. Let's, let's see what it says Revelation is about. It says, <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. So it's the revelation of prophecy. I'm asking you, I don't know, you look at the screen. Is it the revelation of prophecy? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, first and foremost, we need to know that. So the question is, when, when, the, when is the end? What says of the things that are soon to come? And there's, what would you guys do if you found out that the earth was ending in four weeks? I know I've heard, I've read multiple books on the topic. I've heard so many songs, there's some really good songs. Um, but there's a funny story that I, I, I find entertaining, but this guy was asked, if the world was ending in four weeks, where would you go or what would you do? And he's like, I'm going to go to my mother-in-law's house. He's, they're like, why? They're like, because then it'll be the longest four weeks of my life. <laughs> like, okay, all right. <laughs> It's funny to think about, but in, in all honesty, like if the world was ending, or if the world is ending, like what would you do? And so the question is, how long do we really have? 
Jesus tells us in the last chapter of Revelation of the Bible, he says he is coming quickly and that we will be blessed if we keep the words of the prophecy of Revelation. Revelation 22, 7, once again, it says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the word of prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation. But maybe, maybe you don't believe me, okay? So he says it again. Revelation 22, 12. And he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the... Oh, this is the same thing. My bad. One more time. Oh, no, I was right. My bad. Revelation 22, 12. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward with, is with me to give to everyone according to his own work. That's twice. Same chapter, different verse, okay? Maybe you still don't understand that he's coming quickly. We'll try. Okay, one more time. One more time. Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so comes the Lord Jesus three times in one chapter. Do you, if you want me to go back through it one more time, we can. Revelation 22.7, Revelation 22.12, and Revelation 22.20 all say that he is coming quickly. So why do we approach life as if we have all the time in the world? The book of Revelation was written by John. If you guys are familiar with the um, apocalyptic legacies of this man, he was a man that could seemingly never die. Um, I don't know, have you guys ever seen the movie Hercules where they try, like, try to cut his lifeline and it turns golden? For some reason, this is kind of the life that he was living. We're gonna call it because he was directly attached to Jesus Christ, um, but they try to put him in a vat of oil, nothing. Uh, I think they tried feeding him the dogs, nothing. So eventually they just said, okay, can't get rid of this dude, so we're gonna send him off to Patmos. Patmos was like uh, the island for bad guys. Um, and so he just kind of sat there and lived out his day, longest disciple. But in this time, he writes the Revelation and it says that when he was on the Isle of Patmos and he began writing the book of Revelation, he didn't know exactly when the end would be. And I, and personally, and, and I think God in his wisdom didn't tell John because if we knew when the end was, I don't, think, I don't think we'd be doing the things that we need to. Why worry about our debt? The world is ending. <laughs> okay, why, why worry about you know, agriculture and developing our lives here on earth? The end, the world, the end is, and so uh, you know, I think the Lord left that little tidbit out. But that doesn't mean that he didn't give us signs. So I'm from, Tampa, as you guys heard, but I go to school up in, at Southern at Adventist University, which is in Tennessee, Chattanooga area, right? So one of the things, if you guys have ever driven that path before, is that you have to go through the beautiful Atlanta. Wow. That'll, that'll teach you patience. Yeah. Um, it'll also teach you to focus. Um, because one lane will turn into an exit before you realize that it even turned into an exit, but then there's actually not lines to divide the lane. You just kind of got to know that it I don't like Atlanta. Anyways, it's so interesting to me because it's about an eight-hour drive, and if you guys have ever done a road trip before, you know you're looking at the signs, like, okay, my favorite sign is the rest stop. <laughs> I love that sign. I'm like... <laughs> I know they have a little coffee machine for me and a little bathroom break. Sometimes there's cute puppies in the yard. Love that. But these signs are meant to be our benefit, right? And for some reason, as when I'm on my drive, sometimes all the signs will look the same. I'm not even reading them sometimes. I'm like, wow, that's another green one. It's, I still have like five more hours, so why do I actually have to look at them? And it's so interesting because in the same way, God has given us several signs. And sometimes we're so focused on getting where we're going, you, you miss them. Or maybe you get them confused. For me, sometimes the abundance of signs in Atlanta actually confuse me more than they help me. So that's what we're going to be breaking down today. The signs that Jesus has given us about the end of times. Matthew 24 is where we're going to start. And Jesus preaches a sermon on the signs of his return, which is recorded in Matthew chapter 24. The signs you will read in Matthew are like the signs you'll read in Revelation. You'll notice that these two books are heavily intertwined. 
And you can basically compare Matthew and Revelation at any point, and they have one common event in common, common, and that is the second coming of Christ. The disciple of Jesus wondered what the signs pointing to the Christ, Christ's second coming could be, and this is what Jesus said to them in return. Matthew 24, 3, they asked, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And they said, is there any evidence? And Jesus said, there's actually about 20. He didn't say exactly that. <laughs> but he gave 20 signs that point to his second coming, 19 of which have been fulfilled. Only one specific sign remains. And we're going to group those 19 into four major categories. And then I'll give you the final specific sign. The first category is a spiritual. It's a spiritual one. So basically, Matthew 24, 4 says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying that I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. This is kind of one of the most saddening ones because these are people who are following someone in the name of Jesus when that name is in fact not Jesus. An example of this is this man right here. Have you heard of him? Mm -hmm. His name is Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. He was based in Miami, Florida and he called himself the man Jesus Christ. He had 287 radio programs. In English and in Spanish, he had TV stations and claimed to have two million followers in over 30 countries. This is not a crazy nutcase. This is not a homeless person begging for a few dollars. He died in 2013, although many people, a lot of his followers claim that he couldn't have because he was immortal. This is not plain trickery. This is not easy deceptions. These had mass, this had a person had a mass following. So much so, people got him tattooed. His number was 666. Mass following. These are things that are happening now. A couple other examples that I'll quickly touch on is there was this one guy who's native out of Australia and he literally claims to have the memories of Jesus Christ. And he's married to Mary Magdalene. And she has memories of the crucifixion. They have a following. These are real people. These are real things that are happening. Jesus not only said that false Christs would appear, but he also said that they would try to deceive through miracles. As we get closer to the end of time, we expect to see a rise in these deceptions. Now, who does it say that it, he will deceive? It says that he'll deceive the elect. And who are the elect? God's people. So even God's people are at risk of deception. There is only one thing that we can know of truth. And that is the Bible. Amen. The deceptions of the last days will be overwhelming, even to God's people. Unless they firmly believe in the Bible, they will be misled. The purpose of these presentations is to protect you from the deceptions that are coming upon our world. And we aren't just going to take you to a newspaper. We're going to take you to the Bible. So let's talk about that second category, political. <sighs> you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, for nation will rise against nation. Obviously, we don't have any wars going on right now. That's nothing we can relate to. It's terrifying. Did you know there's over 27 conflicts going on around the world at this very moment?
But Jesus didn't even predict a single war. He predicted that the entire world would be at war. That's definitely not something that happened twice. And there's only one period in history when the world had been engulfed in war, and it was the 20th century, the 1900s. And it wasn't just one war, but we know it to be two. Eight, 180 million deaths are calculated to have gone because of this war alone, because of these wars. <laughs> world conflict, nations against nations. And I find it interesting because it's set apart from the fighting and the, the wars that we see in the Bible for some reason. There is extreme brutality and casualties in these. This is the end of times. And to this day, our, we're still at war. Entire cities are being decimated in Syria and Iraq. In the last 20 years, over a quarter million people have died as a casualty in these two countries alone. Well, let's not even get started on our, our nuclear ability today. Never have we been at the risk more than we have now, at the touch of a button. The United Nations issued a warning this year that the risk of nuclear weapons is the highest use since the end of the Cold War. It's kind of easy to, to put these facts in our back brain because, in the back of our brain, because at least, you know, I'm driving to school, I'm driving to work. I'm not thinking about the nuclear button. But as soon as that nuclear button is pressed, I'm thinking about the nuclear button. Like I said, there's 27 active, 27 active conflicts going on in the world. And it's so funny because we don't know all of them. Wars and rumors of wars. Our third category, we've looked at the spiritual, we've looked at the political, let's look at the physical. Matthew 24, seven. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. I spent a month in Bangladesh, the world's poorest country, about a year ago. Actually, it would have been almost exactly a year to this time of when I got back. Our currency over there is worth exponentially more. I worked at, as a kind of like daycare worker at an orphanage over there. Um, I loved my time there. Um, but it's really hard to see things that we have taken for granted and then go to a third world country and see their reality. I'm seeing kids go to bed hungry, kids sleeping on um, pieces of wood. Um, and these are in Seventh-day Adventist um, programs. And this is the, these are the best of the best over there. Um, I remember the kids would get so excited when missionaries come because we bring, what, like $50 for the month that we're gonna be there. And that's enough for them to have um, special tea, which is just tea with milk and sugar. But 20 cents is enough to get enough for everybody to have milk and sugar for the night. I remember when I got sick, because obviously you go overseas, you're gonna get sick. If someone tells you you're not gonna get sick, they're lying to you. And I was one of those people that was like, I'm just gonna rough it and tough it. Like, you know, I'm not gonna take the meds the doctor gave me. I'm just gonna get it over with. Don't do that. <laughs> but anyway, I had the sweetest kids and they ran out and got me some seven up. Um, but obviously I gave them some of my money. Um, and I remember giving them like, I think a dollar. Cause I was like, oh, that'll probably be enough for a bottle. They came back with the equivalent of 70 cents. I got a liter bottle um, for 30 cents over there of 7-Up. I don't know if you guys ever tried to buy a liter bottle of 7-Up in a gas station here, but it's about 350. I think that was a very alarming realization to me because this is their reality and this was mine. Um, and this is, this is on average. Did you guys know that this is a, a map of the hunger in our world? And the stats, I don't know if you can see them, but the red goes from 35% and higher, and then the blue is 2.5% of their population and lower. 
The blue are the places where, on average, you have most of the people not going to bed hungry. And that's still not including the fact that all of these nations have hunger. On average, it's 10% of our world that goes to bed hungry every night. And it's funny, too, because we have enough food in the world to feed everyone. Floods, fires, and deadly heat are alarm bells of the planet on the brink. This was July 13th of 2023. You guys just saw um, the hurricane that swept through Fort Lauderdale. We see the, the Canadian fires. You remember the mass destruction of Ian in the September of last year? Like I told you, Fort Lauderdale, 25 inches of rain fell in April. Canadian wildfires. There are people in Illinois who have actually taken videos. If you guys can see where Chicago is on here. Um, there are people in Chicago and in Illinois who have taken pictures of outside their window and there's just smoke everywhere. They're not even in Canada. We have increasing searing heat across the Southwest, which obviously us in Florida have never experienced. This is the chart showing the cost of natural disasters for the last 30 years. What's clear in this trend is that disasters are getting worse three to four times more than it was 30 years ago. It's like that there's an ad that you see sometimes, but there's, if you guys have ever heard, and obviously I'm not saying to do this, but if you've ever heard of how to cook a frog, the way to do it is to slowly turn up the heat because then they never jump out. I wonder if we're frogs sitting in a boil of boiling water. We know nothing about viral viruses. My God, I remember my entire senior year of high school was just down the drain. Sometimes I still get a little um, sad when I see like the new kids going on their senior trips and having graduation. I'm like, wow, I love that for you guys. I never got that. Corona shut down the entire world. The entire world. Cancer, it afflicts millions, takes the lives of millions, and we still have no cure. Stephen Hawking is one of our greatest minds. He's supposed to be like the, the creme de la creme of the people on this earth. This is his quote, I believe that life on Earth is at an ever-increasing risk of being wiped away or wiped out by a disaster, such as a nuclear war, a genetically engineered virus, or other dangers. I think the human race has no future if it does not go to space. One of our greatest minds has given up on this Earth. I, I, I'm starting to think that the end might be near. There will be earthquakes in various places, and we've recently experienced a period that had one of the highest rates of great earthquakes ever recorded. According to Tom Parsons, a research ge uh, ge geophysicist at the United States Geology ge Geological Society, our earthquakes are not only getting more frequent, but they're getting worse. No one, absolutely no one can forget about the 2004 tsunami. It struck South Asia, killing over 200,000 people. But Jesus said that the biggest earthquake is yet to come. If you guys aren't familiar with how tsunamis work, it is based off of the shift of tectonic plates. So it's basically an earthquake that happens underwater. And when it happens underwater, we get the aftershock.
Revelation 16, 18 says, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. There will be a great earthquake accompanied by a storm. The Bible continues to say that it will be such a mighty and great earthquake that it's not occurred since men were on the earth. That kind of scares me because the last time that we had a statement like that, talking about like the biggest thing since the that people have seen on the face of the earth, that was Noah and the flood. And personally, I would like to not have to experience that. I'm all right. I'm one of those people who can learn from other people's mistakes. I do not need to go through a flood. But this one, this, this earthquake is supposed to be so terrifying and so scary. But that's not the point of all of this. As amazing as it is to, to look back and see the prophetic stuff said in scripture, the real hope and the real point of this meeting is Jesus Christ. The world is not gonna end in some kind of nuclear war or in a natural disaster or in some kind of other massive catastrophe is going to end with the second coming of Christ. Amen. And it's not what will happen, it's who will come. We'll describe it this way. When a woman goes into labor, are you guys familiar with contractions? How many people in here have given birth to a child? Now, that's lovely. How many people have witnessed giving birth to a child? Maybe because, you know, some, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so you guys know what I'm talking about here. So when the, when the contractions begin, right first, there's like a little one, about 20, what, maybe an hour apart. Then they start getting more frequent and more frequent and more frequent. In the same way, we kind of apply this same kind of methodology in looking at the way that our signs are coming. First, it was a couple hundred years apart. Now we're getting to the point where it's, the baby's on the way. And in the same way, it's a good thing because we know that someone is coming. Matthew 24, 32 says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When, the branch, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you will know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that, near, know that it is near at the doors. This is in the same prophecy. Jesus gives this illustration. And so you know how after a long winter, you start to finally see leaves on a tree, and then suddenly the whole neighborhood is transformed? Personally, I love that. It's one of the reasons why I tell people to go to Southern, if not for anything, but it's to see Tennessee in the spring. It's letting you know that winter is over and that summer is almost here. So, Jesus says, when you see all these signs happening, know that Earth's winter is almost over. I wanted to put it to you this way. Let's say you guys invited me over for lunch. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so happy to come. And you told me to let you know when I'm on my way. Okay, cool. So when I get in my car, I text you. Cool, cool, cool. Um, then I hit traffic a little bit, but I tell you that I'm like 25 minutes out now. Cool. Awesome. Um, I'm kind of getting lost in your neighborhood, but it says I'm about 15 minutes out, so I let you know that I'm 15 minutes out. Oh, now I'm looking for your street number, so I text you again, um, and now I'm about literally like three, four minutes out. Then you hear the door slam outside, right? Okay, so someone's here. Let's say you have a dog. The dog starts barking. Okay, cool, cool. And then you, there's a knock on your door. Awesome. What was the point? Is the point all of the things that told you that I was coming or the fact that I was coming? See, because we can hear the dog barking, we can hear the door close, we can hear the, see the text messages, we can pay attention to all these things, but the point of it is that I have come. The point of all of these things is not to look at disaster and disaster, it's to look at the second coming of Christ. This is the way we have to look at these things. Now, the fourth category, social. These three sets of signs are clearly labor pains, and they tell us that Jesus is coming soon. Praise God. But Jesus refers to this sign. He's referring to the days of Noah. Remember how I mentioned Noah? How I didn't want to go back there? There's no escaping. 
Matthew 24, 37 says, but as the days of Noah were, so will the second coming of man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah had entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away. Now there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking there. Nothing wrong with getting married is there. But it's how those things are done that is the problem. We've placed eating and drinking above God. We've placed marriage above God. All of these are signs of the last days. And what were the people in the days of Noah doing? They were giving themselves over to worldly pursuits. It's best said that they, they were in the pursuit of pleasure rather than in the pursuit of Christ. That is something very, very important to take and reflect on in our own lives. Genesis 6, if we want to understand specifically about the story of Noah, this is where the story of Noah can be seen. Genesis 6, 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts was his every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually it's kind of interesting because the word that is used here as far as to, to emphasis continually means thought after thought after thought after thought that's one thing to have an inherently wicked heart wow thought after thought after thought When we see the senseless killing in, in Ukraine, we know that people's hearts are becoming evil. When we see the genocides in Rwanda, we know that evil is here. First Timothy 4 says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lo boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This describes what is happening in our world. We're at an all-time high for pornography. Two out of two-thirds of men admit to watching pornography on a daily basis. This is not even, it's higher, I believe, with the younger generation. And that includes both genders. Never more has it been easier. Pleasure and indulges are at the tips of your finger. But once again, we have to recognize that all these signs are shouting towards Christ. We are living in the earth's last hour. So tonight, I don't want to leave you discouraged. That's not the point of this, because there really is hope amidst the horror. Luke 21, 28. This is the time where we're going to lift our heads to stop looking at the problems and start seeing the signs as the great hope of Jesus is coming. It says, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads, because your redemption draws near. Remember how the disciples asked for a sign? Well, the only definite sign that Jesus gave to them was this one right here. The gospel will be preached to the whole world and then Jesus will come. Along with all the bad news comes some good news. After all, we are not to look to the crisis, but to Christ. In the end, the devil does not win. The world does not go up in smoke. Instead, God sends his incredible news about Jesus to give people hope and courage in the last days, to give them something to look forward for, as the labor pains get stronger and more intense. Matthew 24, 14, directly read is, and this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. It's already happening. It's kind of cool to be a part of a movement, to be a part of something bigger than yourselves. This is in Papua New Guinea. 
Over 150,000 people came out to evangelistic series, and over more than 4,000 of them were baptized. It was Pentecost, just all over again. How about this one? This is in India, where for years Christians had been on a decline, and in Hinduism and Islam were gaining ground. There's been a change over the last decade. There have been several recent baptisms where over 10,000 people have been baptized in one day. But obviously you can't have mass baptisms and publicize them, but it's happening. But what about China? In China, internet, groups, internet use is growing by leaps and bounds. One known website is Christian Sermons. That's a website that's being wildly used in China. And right now, they're on track to become one of the biggest Christian countries. To make it even more real, there are more Christians in China than Christians in the UK and in France combined. China is to become our biggest nation, estimated to be in the next 15 years. Truly, the gospel is going to the whole world. The final sign of Jesus' return is happening before our eyes but it would mean nothing if you're not ready. Do you remember the old song that goes, turn your eyes upon Jesus? Look full in his wonderful life, in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Tonight he is calling you to leave behind the things of this world and to come to him. Don't look at the crises. Don't look at your failures. Look at Christ. He knows what you're going through, and he is waiting tonight to bring you home. So as we close out tonight, this is my appeal for you. I want everybody to close their eyes as we have our final prayer. And if you want to make a decision today that you want to meet your best friend and you want to rid yourself of the pain and guilt of this world, and you're saying, Lord, I'm ready, and I'm ready to ready myself. I want you just to lift your hand so that heaven can see it as we pray. Lord, you see these soldiers, these people petitioning and offering up their hearts to be ready for you in your second coming. God, we refuse to be left behind. We recognize the suffering that is more than prevalent in our world. We recognize the things of this earth that sometimes feel like crushing weight. And God, we, we lift up our burdens to you in this moment, Lord. We ask us, we ask you to ready us, to soften our hearts, to bring us to the cross. God, may we be transformed through these next couple of weeks. May these meetings bring the Bible to life for us. May we be consumed by the joyous hope of your soon return. Lord, come down and come down and collect these kids, these children of yours. We offer up our hearts, for we are ready and waiting. In your servant's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Trinity. You know, I was 14 years old, Trinity, when I, I had a dream. And in that dream, it just, uh, I saw things happening all around, and it really shook me. And I realized that God was waking me up to let me know that Jesus was coming. It's been a number of years since then, you know that, you can see. But I got to tell you, I came to know the one who is my dear friend, Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that this is prophecy being fulfilled. The message is being proclaimed, and uh, we want to be ready. Amen. Thank you for joining in, praying and joining, hearing Trinity's message tonight. It's a message from the Lord. Folks, I want to take a moment and just encourage you to 
uh, have those studies and take time and take those studies and do them at home. Turn them in. Tomorrow we're going to be meeting again at 7 p.m. I mentioned several things, and that is that we're going to give out one of these Bibles to those who complete those studies. This is an Andrew Study Bible. Beautiful, informative, and we'd love for you to have it. Also, I'm going to throw this out. James is our co-host, James. Uh, on Sunday, Sunday evening, we have some number of meetings going on. Um, and Sunday evening at 7 p.m., James is going to be co-hosting here, and we're going to ask how many have invited so many of your friends and others to come and join you. And we're going to give out, as a gift, one of these. And so it's not too late to invite a friend and bring them over, and we'd love to be able to hand this to you. Well, this is a moment where we know the story says that we can all win with Jesus. Tonight, why don't we win as well? We have something for you. How many here like gifts? Anybody like, oh, hands went up right away. We all like gifts, and we like to do this. I think we're ready. We have little tickets, right, that we're giving out. And so we have these little buckets, and we're just going to draw tonight from uh, two. We have two gifts tonight. And so we're going to take a drawing from one of these tickets. Hold on to your ticket. You have it. We want you to hold on to your ticket and look at it. Okay. Rick, come on up here. All right. You want to shake that up a little bit? There he is. And we want you. No, you don't have one. Some of you don't have one. Did you register uh, when you came in, some, okay, we have some tickets still. Okay, let's get tickets. We'll wait up. All right, no problem at all. All right, great. And so um, as that's getting prepared, we just want to make sure you're in there. We don't want you to lose out. And we want to bless you tonight with just at least a, a gift. Uh, we're going to do two tonight, but we'll continue each evening. So if tonight you don't get one, don't worry. There's still opportunity. And so thank you. Thank you. I see folks here coming out tonight. Uh, we're glad you're here. Let's just get that quickly over. The thing about the handout for this evening, you heard Trinity speak to you, sharing with you about these signs we're going to have at the end of the meeting. As you're heading out in the foyer towards the other double doors, there's going to be a table. In there is a summary of this evening. Again, something that we value is that you don't just take her word. You don't just take my word. You actually go and read and look up those scriptures that are provided. Look at it for yourself and see what God has to say. How are we doing, Rick? Jane? All right, let's bring it up here. Very good, very good. And if it's not, we'll have it for tomorrow. Let's quickly, and I want to tell you, one of the gifts we have for you is plant-based, simple, nutritious, delicious. This is a recipe book. I wish, I wish this was scratch and sniff, because as I turn the pages, it's already drawing my attention. <laughs> I said that to one of the gentlemen who did the presentations. This is one of the gifts we're going to have for you this evening. Rick, come on over. And then I'm going to also have another drawing. Let's see. All right. Well, why don't we do this? Thank you, Tim, on the piano. Tim, would you pull one out? We're going to have Tim pull one out for us. I know you're all looking, you're waiting. And let's uh, bring it over and we'll read that. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, this is almost like the doors of probation are closing, folks. This is the final call. This is it. All right. At least for tonight, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. And let's see this one right here. And the winner is, oh yeah, this is the one where you needed to give it to somebody who has good eyesight. Oh, yeah, you're going to tell me, right? <laughs> can you read it? I can read it. I think I can read it. Here it goes. Two, nine, four, six, nine, six, three. 
All right, congratulations. Put our hand, here's the book for her. Can you get that to her? Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, and one more. And I think, um, uh, you might not want this. This is a $25 Amazon card. Are we ready for the next one? $25 Amazon card. All right. Rick, we're going to have Trinity select this one. She's right up here. <laughs> A little drill. There we go. Thank you. Are you ready? And the winner of this card is number two, nine, four, six, nine, eight. One. That's you? Oh my good. All right. All right. Here is your card. <laughs> I believe you folks. It is his. All right. Well, there is going to be more. We're going to have more coming up soon. We want to invite you to bring a friend, family member. Come out. Join us. Because tomorrow we're going to look at Prophecies Code. Trinity will unpack that for us. Have a wonderful evening. And let's see, as we're about to sign off, you have something for us. Okay. So folks, as you are exiting, we want to provide you an easy way for every evening to come out and be a part of the, the Revelation of Hope we have for you, go see our folks who help assist with registration, we have a, a key tag. And this allows us to know as you come for each evening, that way we are able to keep track. So see Malisha. Thank you, Malisha. And now, good evening. God bless you. And drive safely. We look forward tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. to be together. Thank you so much.